Uh, before we listen to Michael Fay, uh, we are going to listen to an Italian critic called uh, Luigi Prestinenta, Prestinenza Pulisi. He is an architectural critic and uh, teaches at the history uh, uh, teaches the history of contemporary architecture at the University of Rome and the University of Syracuse. He's a regular contributor to the Italian architectural magazines Domus, Larca, Costruire, L'Architettura e Il Progetto. He has written several architectural books on contemporary architecture, a monograph on Rem Kulhas called uh, Metropolitan Transparencies, a monograph on Saha Hadid, and one book translated in English and Korean, Hyper Architecture space in the electronic age. He is one of the editors of the series L'Universale di Architettura, founded by Professor Bruno Zevi. His last book is called Tre Parole per il prossimo futuro, or something like Three Words for the Immediate Future. He came all the way from Rome to this event uh, with you, Luigi Prestinenza Puglisi. Hello to everybody. I don't know why Michele wanted me to speak at this lecture, because my English is so bad. But I'll, uh, I'll try. He promised that, that he, if, I, if, if you don't understand me, he will uh, translate. But I prepared a little speech. I have this speech here with some, uh, some slides. So. We'll try, okay. Allora, in an article written in 1986, uh, titled uh, At least architecture is on the wing again, Peter Cook announced uh, a new architecture. This was uh, the architecture of Zadid, Colas, and uh, of some Californian architects. And he said this. There is a strict link between Europe and America, between London and Los Angeles, between... Oh, if there is no light, I cannot read. <laughs> okay, it's more difficult, I'll continue. Between, <laughs> between Architectural Association and uh, uh, the University in uh, Los Angeles. Today, presenting uh, Michele Sei, the Sai, I would li like to say this. Uh, there is a strict link between Italy and uh, California. In fact, uh, Michele, uh, for 10 years, uh, stayed in Italy and worked with Super Studio. With Super Studio. Exactly the same Super Studio that inspired, among others, Ren Kulas the same super studio that was one of the leading group of uh, the exhibition Italy, the new domestic landscape made in 1972 that presented Italian culture, radical Italian culture in the USA. New Italian architecture in this moment uh, is in crisis. Uh, we stay in uh, horrible times. Uh, historicism is everywhere. You cannot build anything new without being accused of destroying the city, the tradition, the, the values, all this kind of tea. Of course, in Italy there are new architects. Uh, some are very interesting. And I hope in the future, I was talking to Michele about this, uh, to show you some of these uh, new Italian uh, architects. But they are not, as traditional critics would imagine, very Italian. They are Italian, but they live in a different condition. They are cosmopolitan. They mix different cultures. In a certain way, they do what Michele does. I don't think that architecture can be local. Look, for instance, at the disaster done by Moneo with his church in Los Angeles. When I went there, I found it a passo double. 
in a so sophisticated city, in a city in which you hope to hear rock music or uh, hip hop, uh, you see this uh, old traditional uh, stuff. No, I think the new condition is more Michele like. Uh, and, and I would say this uh, uh, of, of Michele. Michele was born in, in Iran. He studied in another country, Italy, and he, he worked in another country, that is USA. And he mixes in a clever way all the three things. He is Mediterranean, I would say Medio Oriental. And from this point of view, uh, no, and I say uh, he, lack, he lacks body because he is Mediterranean. He lacks, uh, uh, but he is formalist because he is Italian, but he is not formalist uh, in, in, in a certain sense, but in another, he likes space. And uh, he's working with strange forms. He's uh, a little Californian. So he's a mix. Uh, uh, if uh, I uh, worked before and I saw all these strange things, and uh, this is very Californian. So, uh, at the same time, Michele is neither Iranian, nor Italian, nor Californian, but he's all the three uh, together. And I think this is a good, a good approach. And now, to finish my introduction, I would show you some slides in, in which I found four different Michele. Uh, oh, well, I don't know why in USA you use this podium. Uh, we talk in Italy, we talk in a more relaxed way with the table. Uh, we stay more. Allora. Allora, let's show. Pathos, you are waiting. Allora, these four uh, phases of his uh, work uh, are the first is connecting, the second is body, the third is fluidity, and the fourth is energy. Connecting. Uh, if, if you look uh, at these uh, building that was one of the first uh, works uh, he, he did, you see that he breaks the corner uh, and, and this breaking is uh, done is done to connect two different poles uh, to different poles. Yeah, two different 
walls of the of the building so th there is this idea of uh, uh, excavating the, the building to to make new connections between And there is this strange bridge uh, that don't link the, the, the two poles in, in reality, but uh, uh, visually it, it does. Uh, that, that I think is the key to uh, look at, at his uh, first uh, period. Uh, uh, bridge between uh, Poland. The second, the second phase of his work is body. Uh, this is an interesting work of art by Marina Abramovic. Uh, when I look at this photo, I think when you stay in an elevator, that you, you don't have space for your body. Now, how bodies... Uh, uh, behave with architecture. This is an interesting team. And in this, uh, in this uh, uh, work, uh, that is uh, an interior in a shop, uh, you see that Michele is uh, working with this uh, idea, uh, having an architecture that is more body-like. the body is connected with the earth and I, I think it's interesting this, this, this project is more an artist project but there are some ideas that I think you will find in, in the architecture that we'll do later and one, uh, one uh, uh, idea of uh, Michele is uh, the point of view. Uh, the architecture is uh, a place in which you uh, organize uh, your point of view. Uh, um, you see reality in uh, different ways. This is a long story. Body is your point of view. It's too difficult to explain in English. If you uh, catch the idea, it's okay. If not, <laughs> I get. The third phase of uh, Michele is uh, fluidity. Uh, you see that from the earth, uh, you conquer the sky. Waves uh, is another way of uh, staying uh, in the sky. Deconstructing. Uh, you know. In this uh, uh, work, uh, the idea of uh, working with air, with fluidity, with waves, I think uh, that is at its best. I saw this uh, uh, work uh, yesterday and uh, I, I was impressed by the intensity with which Michele organized a so little space. Uh, and in Michele uh, there is always a fun functional approach. Sometimes in this kind of architecture you uh, see that uh, the form uh, destroys uh, the functional approach. It, it is too sculptural and no architectural. In, uh, in Michele there is always 
uh, an idea of space, uh, an idea of the function. Uh, the, 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 he does understand how the body moves through the space. So uh, at the end, uh, um, you don't have never the formalistic approach that uh, is so uh, that is uh, uh, the problem of uh, the blob architecture. Uh, often you see all this blob architecture, and you you, you cannot imagine how to live uh, in uh, in this. And, uh, uh, here you, you have. Uh, good functions, all, always good, uh, good functions. The fourth phase that I, I think is the phase in which Michele is uh, working now is a kind of sum of the three other phases. And uh, you see that there is uh, air, water, earth, fire, energy, and so on. Uh, I will show you this uh, project uh, for uh, a place in Tuscany, near, uh, near Florence. And it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I, if you look uh, uh, at this project, uh, it looks like other projects that now uh, many architects are doing. But there are things uh, that are new, that are completely new. One uh, is uh, the attention for, for the point of view. We have already seen uh, this attention in the work of uh, Michele. But in this project, I think uh, it's... Uh, a, a, a good uh, and uh, is a, a, an idea forte, uh, a strong idea, idea forte, a strong idea. Uh, look at the section and look uh, at the way in which air and earth mix together because uh, the building is of the earth, but at the same time of the air. This is what I mean uh, when I say is uh, playing to put together all these things, uh, body, air, earth. Well, I have finished. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you for coming here tonight. Especially, um, I'm very happy to be here because my father is here and uh, it makes me very happy to see him. This is the first time I think he sees me lecture. Um, um, the, the process in which my work has evolved um, has been certainly um, influenced by many influences, um, the different cultures that Luigi was mentioning uh, coming, was being born from Iran and then um, getting educated in, uh, in Italy and finally um, establishing my home here in Los Angeles has been a long way um, is in a sense is like other people's life it's it's the it's what gets you to where you want to go and different steps are just steps towards the goals you have set for yourself and for your life and the decisions you have made along the way um, things you have done or didn't do and decisions that um, helped other uh, other things to happen. 
um, Los Angeles was, in, in a sense, or maybe SIAR to, to a certain extent, was an important part of this process for me. The development of my work is in Los Angeles um, is partially uh, because of the help I got from the SIAR community, being part of this in, environment and being um, first in the studio of, of um, Tom Main and Michael Rotondi and later on uh, my own studio. But during all these years being part of the SIAR community, which I think was extremely important. And I've had the opportunity to look back and look at the, this whole process in, in different times and different ways, especially you know, when every time you have to come and speak in front of the people who know you and you know most of them, you're more obligated to, to try to be as honest as you can about what you say and what you have done. Um, um, looking at SciArc, um, of course, we have to acknowledge the conditions in which architecture was when Ray Cappy founded the school in 1972. It's extremely important to understand that um, it was, in a way, was a response to the state of architecture at the international level. It was in a very direct link to the state of architecture in in United States. Um, the the modernist uh, teaching or uh, was very much rejected by the by the establishments or intellectual establishment in the United States. And, um, and um, in the famous um, book by uh, Venturi, um, Complexity and Contradiction, he actually um, invites architects of, of the United States to, to seek and find a, a form of architecture which is more about who they are and what they are. In, instead of copying the European models which they were doing in terms of education and in terms of uh, production of architecture, he's inviting everyone to the United States to take a, take a stand and take a position about it. Of course, immediately after that, uh, we have the, the five architects will come out. Um, the, the five architects by uh, Frampton and then his followers, Tafuri, who was in, in Italy, um, they kind of create an image of the five architects being what the American architecture is about, and uh, which means the architects of only the five represent the, the whole country and, and obviously just the East Coast. And for years, um, and I remember it vividly, the West Coast was totally ignored by the architectural community at the American uh, architectural community and Europe. So you can understand that 1972, the five architects comes out. And at the same time, Ray Cappy founds the School of Architecture in 1972. Quite interesting coincidences, but very much is about where the architectural movement after that in especially in Southern California, especially uh, here, where we are living or have been living, uh, changes everything. In 1980, this Domus issue of 1980 with the cover, with the picture of Frank Gehry, and then inside uh, the, the group of very young architects came out. It was a revolution. It was calling that something is happening here that nobody is, can ignore, but at the same time saying that um, in a you know, not direct way, saying that this is, this is the young generation in, in Southern California, but this young generation is SciArc. So the young generation on the West Coast who becomes recognized as the sort of the um, the carriers of this movement or the, the people who are starting this movement being acknowledged by the European is SIAR. And uh, of course you know most of the people on that, on that photograph. Um, 
the, they all had more hair, you know. So, especially Eric. Um, um, they, the perception of architecture is in transition now. It's, uh, you know, the West Coast group is being recognized by Europe, by United States, and everything is happening very quickly. This group that we just saw were the, um, were the first of this generation who actually were, were remotely recognized. Um, and sad enough, um, the other group that before them who brought them to that position are being ignored more and more because uh, there's li very little time and very few uh, people can really be on the foreground of this movement. Um, Eric Moss, uh, Tom Main, Michael Rotundi, um, and a group that um, they, they have truly have produced some of the best and most important pieces of contemporary architecture. But at the same time, one thing that is undeniable is the role that SciArc again, I, I come back to SciArc because I'm, I'm realizing that it was far more important than we can even imagine because just the whole perception of education of architecture now is in transition. The old SciArc where, you know, where I was first, when I first arrived in Southern California, went and visited was you know, it was was a was a complete new was a complete a new phenomenon for as an architecture school. The architecture school where people work, produce, um, experiment. There's no boundaries for them, and do everything in their power to express themselves. Was not part of the architectural education in the United States or anywhere else in the world. That was completely new. It was invented by SciArc. And, and that's, that's what we have to realize for understanding the whole architectural movement in Southern California and the people like Eric and Tom and, and Michael and then everybody else that followed, followed their path. So for me, uh, you know, this is, this is the architecture, the sort of the most experimental or the most interesting architecture I knew when I came to Los Angeles. This is uh, Giovanni Michelucci, uh, is one of the most uh, celebrated architects in Italy. And these are the sketches of Leonardo Savioli, which I studied with and had a, had a, a very uh, strong influence on my work. So this is life after morphosis. Um, when I started my own studio and uh, and began um, practicing architecture, um, one of the first projects, Angeli Trattoria on Santa Monica, um, and um, important project for me because that was my one of the very first projects that I was doing on my own, but <clears throat> at the same time, um, all the influences of Morphosis and, and Mike and Tom were, were pretty uh, strongly present in my, in my way of looking and seeing and doing. Um, the, the, the elements, um, the container becoming a container is carrying all these elements in some certain form of harmony and and uh, compositional harmony together and led to a series of other projects uh, which is this is the apartment building um, in Los Angeles of 20 unit apartment building um, during this period the, the body I mean I have been always fascinated with the with the body and uh, how it it influences me during different periods of my work where it's very uh, critical to me and that's how I actually uh, can conceptualize my work where the initial stage in the previous projects until ECRU I think the body was the reading of the body was more um, 
like the, the, the way the modernists uh, read the body. The body is a machine and the body is an objectified and, um, and the architect is sort of platonically involved in the creation of architecture, but it's very um, separated uh, from it. Um, it's not involved. And with the ecru, uh, the, the body starts to become the, the template of, of creating the architecture. Um, the materiality, the, the ju juxtaposition or uh, positioning of the elements within the body, um, body of architecture uh, began to, to formulate and find, find its place. Um, Design Express, another project of that same same generation, where um, always it's easier to escape to the to what you know and what what the modernist uh, uh, movement has taught us because that's that's uh, most of our teachers or who have educated us were strongly influenced by that. Um, then there is a pivotal point uh, when this project, which I call Mavesana which is completely constructed for, for the experiment about the space, uh, started. And um, my, my involvement in the making of, of, the, of the building and experimenting changed. Um, I started criticizing some of the earlier work because I saw them as not taking me really beyond what I, what I knew and wasn't really challenging me. And um, it seemed to me that I'm following the same path that I learned at Super Studio and Morphosis, and I'm not really breaking out of that those influences and, and that tradition. So this was the, one of the first projects that I did that somehow helped me break out of it um, to formulate some ideas about the space, about how the space could be um, organized and by not only by creating individual space, but see the space as a whole where the elements, non-architectural elements, uh, begin to influence the, the space. The position, the, the Luigi talked about um, the relationship of the, of the body in terms of the positioning of the body or body in terms of uh, the object of, of curiosity. The Etan Donné book um, was a revealing, uh, revealing book for me in terms of it really um, invited me to start looking uh, and challenging my vision of the body and space um, in the way that I didn't know where it's going to take me but in a, in a different way. So a series of images started to surface from um, collaging and moving, uh, covering parts and re revealing some other parts, and uh, a series of uh, postcard size collages started to, surf to surface. The fascination still is very much about um, the shape, the, the desire, the not knowing where it can take you or what it can do, but, but, but the exploration was necessary to, to collage and, and try to create images that use the body into the, take the body in consideration and use the body in the creation of architecture, which led to a series of um, uh, clay models. Um, which some were actually modeling after the collages, but uh, some of the other ones are completely um, allowing the body uh, or the hand takes its own toe and, and, and form the space. So the body as a template in the ecru in the marina becomes very much more alive. In this case, the body becomes completely uh, used as it is to the, 
this uh, to the inch to create the the architecture of this space without any compromise. The other project in the same period, um, Angeli Mare, unfortunately none of these projects are existing anymore. Um, to create a container within the container of an existing building and internalize it and turn it completely um, around. There is no real expression on the outside. The, the expression is totally interior. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things I've been very fascinated with, and I think that comes from my um, Italian training, is paying a lot of attention to to details um, in terms of construction of metal and wood and glass. And I, I was like always very fascinated by the work of uh, Scarpa, of course, um, and and Michelucci, and and later on uh, Savioli. They they had uh, they had this sort of very poetic approach towards uh, details and um, and there was always this conversation we had that you know a detail has the same has to have the same strength or power as the entire building and and to a certain extent I I really um, maintained that or tried to maintain that in my in my work I, I paid a lot of attention to the way uh, things were constructed um, so there is another break here. Uh, the body now, the body was a template. The body was an inspiration, and then the body becomes the t actual tool of making the space. And um, the, that's a, like half-inch uh, steel rod that has been formed around the body to create that the shapes and the space that became uh, a space for uh, fundraising and for the vulnerable children. In, uh, in a house built by uh, Paul William. And uh, uh, now the, the body is becoming much more involved in, in actually making some of these things. If one actually makes, makes an attempt, realizes how the body learns by, by doing that and how the shape started to appear, which which the hand with the with the pencil wouldn't have never actually uh, created them, and and at the same period, uh, this is a um, this was a um, installation that I did with the students of uh, A and M University in Florida. In two weeks, we we basically designed and built this um, installation on on one of their campuses, which raised uh, a lot of controversy and. Uh, was removed immediately. Um, so those experiences brings me to this the dental office uh, project, um, which was completely designed from the view of the, someone in the, the dental chair, looking up um, all the all the things that someone can experience by, you know, being under the agony of uh, of having to go through that experience, and. Um, and how to improve that experience architecturally um, and um, doesn't really help by the way the nurses and the doctors love it but the patients for them to be in a small room doesn't make any difference um, so the phase four of the body is that now the body of our architect has to get involved. It's no way of, uh, and how does it get involved to produce something which is not going to be built by him or not going to be realized physically by, by the architect? Um, I had many conversations with a good friend um, about this, Aris Janigian, um, about how, how does the architect can produce a work that that 
and can have the intensity of being produced by him himself, by her or him himself, but at the same time not being constructed by him. Um, it's, a, it's a dilemma because when we make a piece of architecture, we, we kind of step away from it. Um, I envy sometimes the artists or the people who can actually um, build their own work but at the same time, that limits you to a certain scale of work and certain type and limits everything else you, you want to explore in architecture. And this was the house that I designed for, for my sister, an experiment of, of a house on a hillside which cascades and creates a wholeness of space that body actually experience every inch of that space simultaneously so there is no separation at any instance the ins different instances of space are sort of interconnected and every time you turn around the space is always there and you you follow that transition um, another project of that period um, a park a petrosino park in new york a competition um, this, this project was very interesting for me because it um, made me think about parks in a different way. Um, this is like 180 or 190 feet long and uh, at the largest point is, is about um, 40 feet wide. So it's a very small park uh, in, the, in the middle of Manhattan and, uh, and I thought, you know, the existing park, it, uh, the trees or the green uh, grass looks, I mean, it's black, dark because of the fumes and, and the car exhaust and that, you know, that go around it all day. So I, I totally um, uh, resented that and I decided that, you know, this park has to become a park that creates the environments that the park does, but it's not green, it's not trees, it's not necessarily grass so you know it's about shade a place to sit place to refute I mean place to to hide place to pr get protections and all of those elements were playing a role in creating the space not the um, not the fact that it's a park and it has to have water and grass and trees um, this is a project uh, for an, an studio for an artist in uh, in Culver City, um, this artist needed one long um, empty space and a place to put his tools and his his sculptures and his paintings. And um, and it became kind of like a machine at the end, um, which was a full 180 degree back to where I started. Um, I designed it so the parts of that that actually moves and and uh, allows the this artist like to work outside and inside simultaneously at, and and it's easy to do in Southern California. And um, I made a lot of movable spaces and and uh, and, and led to this other project, which was a um, Turco Library in and. Um, in one of the coldest part of the world. Um, the Turku was an interesting uh, experiment. The Turku was the first project that I sort of confronted this issue of not being able to build my own projects uh, by my own hands, in fact. And uh, because of its scale, because of uh, its program, of its, um, its context, I, I sort of wanted to create a whole new context within that city. I resented the, the, the boxes and, and the, the existing architecture around it. Um, and, but at the same time, trying to respond to the, to the surrounding in a different way, to create viewing points from the, from the water, from the mountain, from the um, specific part of the city which were sort of historically very important to the, to the city. It was a very complex program. It had residential areas. The library had to have uh, five or six different departments. The departments had to be each separated from one another. 
Um, so that they all led to to a series of buildings finally that um, started with the, with the house uh, for a friend um, on the Linny Canal. Um, Linny Canal is an interesting uh, interesting site. It's it's a very small sl lots, um, very uh, small, uh, uh, very small buildings, but they're very narrow and long, and um, but they have they have a very interesting part of the history of Los Angeles um, when Abbot Kinney um, started to develop that area as Venice, Italy. Um, he created these wonderful settings, very theatrical settings for for the for the streets, for the canals going through, and the water, and, and the, the centers, etc. So that was that was part of the idea in in our mind. At the same time, my clients, a poet and an artist, um, wanted something that um, embraces their lifestyle. Their they like. They like Venice. They've been living there for a very long time. They like alternative spatial um, conditions. They they both very much interested in architecture. So we started we started working on this, and at the same time, they were very much in, interested in participating. So it was a group effort of bringing all of those ideas together their interest and our interest together into creating this um, this project. And the Settler Fantasy Store was a was a I would call it is now it's a, a, a building with my um, where my my thinking and my language of architecture starts to show itself. It's my like as if the Trattoria Angeli was my super studio and Morphosis project. Cellular Fantasy is my own. Um, it was very interesting um, knowing this building for many years and passing by it and as a home saving bank, and then finally going there and. You know, having to turn it into a cellular fantasy store, which is a store and offices for this uh, phone company, and uh, and you know, for those of you who know the building, it has this very horrendous mural on top of it, and uh, the building is is as Diane Gerardo uh, said, is a fascist building. Um, but and we, we had a big fight with the city of Santa Monica to actually do something with the building. Our design was to put a glass whale or glass cover on the entire travertine building, maintaining the, the mural to, for, for, the, for its entire form, but put a layer on the building to, to change the perception of this building somewhat, which is, you know, it's hard to see it as anything else but the uh, home saving bank, and we failed unfortunately, and um, had to just deal with the interior space and um, this is where some of those ideas of of body and space transparency translucency the materiality it just all was was like boiling up to find a, a way of getting out and this was a great opportunity um, to create a new workspace where people all are in the same environment and, and very little is between them. Just enough to give them privacy, just enough to give them level of comfort, but not making them into little rats in the cubicles. Um, so, you know, experimenting with the, with the materials, the stations, the workspace, uh, was all very much discussed during this process. Um, 
um, there were there was a competition uh, for this project in in Italy. Um, there was in uh, Sardinia, Italy, which I participated and won. And uh, and during the time, it's a cultural center for comparative studies among cultures. It was a center. Um, which is more and more, I think, is needed in the world we live today for different cultures to start solving their problems in the cultural centers instead of um, war. And and interesting enough to have it in a, in Sardinia, which is um, probably is the epitome of not diversity. Let's put it that way. They the, the people in Sardinia. They're very proud of their heritage, very proud of their land. It's a, it's a part of the world which has been attacked uh, more than anywhere else in Europe by, by the Spaniards and the, the Arabs and the Italians and the French and you name it. And yet has maintained a very strong you know, uh, position in which the culture actually has been developed as a pastoral culture even though it's an island. So they have been always retreated to, to the centers and protected themselves by creating fortresses. And, uh, and that's a big part of their architecture. And um, interestingly enough, they have them one of the, some of the most beautiful beaches in the world because the beaches have been left alone. And hasn't been, it's not a fishing culture, it's a, it's a pastoral culture. So they were interested that my client, who's a Dutch philosopher, and the city got together and that land was sold to them for 99 years, for, uh, which is a, um, it's a land of, uh, for uh, agricultural land, which was converted to the cultural use land for the center. And, um, and the project was about creating a non-architectural space is creating, responding, letting the, the, the need for the program deal with the fact that the space has to be created in some relationship to the land. So um, taking the topography of the land and, and trying to create these flying, we call them now flying carpets, as if they arrived from an, um, a land far away and they are landing on the Sardinian uh, peninsula. So, uh, while we were working on this project, another city, Sinalunga, which is between Arezzo and Siena, became interested in this project and became interested in the concept. And a group of their citizens got together and invited us to to go there and participate. Um, in their project of creating a similar project in Sinalunga. So now there are two centers in progress um, in, the, in Italy, one in Sardinia and the other one in Sinalunga. So this is the Sinalunga uh, project. And uh, we, had, um, we had to deal with um, actually our project di Massima or the, or the Avon project has been accepted by the city and they had very specific requirements about the height, about the materiality, and uh, which I think it helped our projects a, a great deal because um, the height is very low in fact, so it forces us to be very close to the terrain, uh, to the ground, and the uh, materiality we used mostly the local uh, materials of the stones and the um, what we could actually excavate from when the excavation was necessary to create the walls and, and the structures. Um, two years ago, uh, we won a, a competition for a series of uh, cafes for the Nes Cafe. We call it Cafe Nes Cafe for the company Swiss company Nestle, um, which it worked very well with our work, our concepts of um, you know because of Los Angeles we kind of are forced to always cre 
create a, something within an existing context that has to influence it, but it's not necessarily a force to do that. Um, the Café Nescafé was very much, um, I mean, the Nestle people very much were interested in creating um, a concept where we can repeat um, this concept and adapt it to different um, context. So we started this very vast uh, research about cafes, um, the, the, um, about the experience of cafe. Uh, we came up with a you know, fast, medium, and, and slow concept of, of space. Um, fast being somebody comes and grabs a cup and runs and facility for that person and medium being someone comes and stands and or sits and then the slow being that you just hang out for forever. Um, so uh, these concepts are sort of led to a series of architectural elements of skin, of ribbon, a program um, for, uh, for, um, for different functions and different uses. So they could become prototypical but at the same time um, interchangeable to form and create different types of um, space. Our project went uh, was very well received by the Nestle people, but then went through a marketing study and and um, and was changed somewhat, which you would see. Um, we designed about seven or eight different locations to test the, to test the concept um, in Paris. So you can see that now it's like an exploded uh, act, so you can see the different components. Um, but the components, this is the adaptation for, uh, for Orléon, the bar element with this place. And that's the, that's the Orléon Café. One of the uh, interesting experiences, part of this experience, was to actually <coughs> deal with the city of Paris, which we were afraid of um, the limitations we might we might face. In fact, uh, they were much more uh, reasonable than the city of Santa Monica. Um, in making these glass uh, structures uh, in front of this this building. Um, which is one of the, the, the noted uh, traditions in Paris life, the cafe, street cafe, terrace. Um, nothing like this was actually, none of the things that we did with this project was following any codes in the, in the code book that we were studying about what a terrace has to be. And yet they, um, they bend the rules, they change their direction and said, you know, this is the time for us that maybe we have to revisit Paris Cafe terraces, that, you know, this is not a bad idea instead of having a lot of uh, metal um, mullions to make the, the glass structure work, maybe, you know, maybe we can use glass as a structure um, and, and it, it didn't work and I think that ultimately they were very, uh, very positive about our approach. And, um, and at the same time, dealing with the cellular fantasy building, we were, um, uh, we were being totally thrown around like a, like a ball um, by the politics of the city and the politics of the people involved. 
and uh, two members of the of the committee resigned because of the you know it got really bad and ugly. Um, to just not to let us put glass in front of an ugly building on on Wilshire Boulevard is just outrageous. And um, so you have to give it to them, the Parisians. I, I was like really pleased that. And this was um, the second, in, in fact, I'm showing a project that um, it was after the project was coming next. And this was a good experiment for us to, to start uh, and do a project of this, of this type. And finally, um, the Publicis project. It's the most important project uh, I have done. Um, again, um, in Paris on Champs Elysees, and um, this door um, was a, was a very symbolic door, and uh, is the door of this, the offices of this gentleman who was the founder of the company, Marcel Blustein Blanchet, who. Um, I started the company in 1927 with very modest means, um, and then finally grew and and developed it into a very large uh, advertising company, which its headquarter now it's on uh, Champs Elysees and other 70 countries in the world. Um, this building is on the second uh, circle of around the Arc of Triomphe, and uh, for that reason it considered to be um, part of the historic um, historical um, monument territory uh, preservation and uh, and we were uh, obliged to deal with the a, a large team of, of historians and preservationists regarding this project and um, and Again, interestingly enough, um, they were extremely cooperative with us, and they became very much involved in the project um, from different stands view, stands of view. Uh, these are the first sketches of the competition um, of inside of that um, of that space. We we changing five levels in the building: first level, ground level, minus one, minus two, and minus three. The program consists of two theaters, um, two movie theaters, um, radio studio, casting studio, a club, a restaurant, um, a bookstore, a newsstand, um, grocery, um, tobacco, cigar store, etc., etc. Um, so these was these were uh, the first uh, sketches um, for the project. And from the beginning, this this heart-like um, element started to appear. Um, one of the things that <coughs> ultimately um, was taken out of the project because it was it was actually changing the whole con context context of the project as being uh, part of an existing building by creating a vertical connection throughout the building. Which didn't ever existed, and the clients really liked it, but it it was beyond their scope of work for for the center, so they abandoned it. But interestingly enough, the part that was not part of the project, which was the facade of the building at the beginning during the competition, then became the most important part of the project. Um, this is the level one, zero. This is the, this is Champs Elysees, and this is uh, the, the second circle around the Arc of Triomphe, Bouprésbourg, and this is Rue Vernet. So the building has um, three facades um, on three completely different streets. Um, at the same time, um, is probably the only building on in, in that area which completely um, occupied by the same client, and uh, and it's a private building. 
uh, this is minus one, the, the two theaters, and uh, and here is the the wine store, the cigar store, the radio studio, the casting studio, and all the kitchen, uh, big part of the kitchen, and that's the all the facilities for the for the cinemas. Images of the interior space, the new stand. So the, the facade became part of the project um, in a very quiet and, and interesting way that the the city officials actually started the discussion. They started demanding to do something about the facade. They said, well, you know, this building is 30 years old, 32 years old, and we have a lot of buildings like this in Paris, and these buildings, they're all going to be, they, they all need something, something to be done to them in the next uh, five or ten years. So why don't you uh, propose uh, something to us? And that's when we started exploring uh, the ideas and uh, very shy way, you know, creating this corner piece. Uh, this was, that's where this, this whole idea about the, about the storefront and the facade began. And uh, in a very strange way. And then after that, um, when they, they saw our first uh, sketches and they responded we we started actually um, exploring it based on the codes based on the materiality of it um, and and finally this version was was the one that um, we liked and I think they liked uh, because there was the first uh, for the first time uh, the existing building was being challenged uh, by by another building. In fact, the two, even though they're part of the same building, um, in in our view, we wanted to keep them separate. We wanted to keep two architectures that live together rather than one becoming part of the other or vice versa. So the idea was to create a form and a, a strategies in which the piece can can survive independently of the of the rest. So these veils of the, the glass, uh, curved glass and steel structure, was created on the on the existing facade um, using. Uh, using some of the existing structure but reinforcing some of the other parts of the structure and um, identifying the corner which was totally ignored by the old building um, in relationship to the Arc of Triomphe. some of the structural drawings um, for, for the glass and the curvature of the glass. And um, each piece of glass practically becomes uh, different than the next. So um, there are over hundreds of different sizes and shapes of glass to construct uh, the facade. <coughs> the glass is a low iron glass, which, uh, which is very clear, uh, known as crystal glass. In fact, uh, this is a, a test that we did on the building. This is like one of the smallest pieces of glass, um, which is one meter AD by um, three meter high. And the structure uh, is actually glued to the back of the back of the glass, and then connected to the main structure to be held. So, at the end, you know, there is a little. Uh, safety brackets that holds the piece in place, but the, the whole piece is 
glued to the, to the main structural pieces. Um, there is a very interesting uh, Chinese proverb that says to the best thing you can give to your children is um, roots and wings. Um, I think um, he gave me the roots and you gave me the, the wings. Thank you very much. <laughs>